Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We need to approach the Lord in the right way in order that we can serve Him and do the things that He has called us to do. And what we have seen and what we'll see in clear terms this evening is preparation is necessary for service. Preparation is necessary for worship. Well, take out your Bible. And look with me to the book of Exodus and chapter 30. The book of Exodus and chapter 30. We began this chapter last week and God willing will complete this chapter in this time of study. And we're going to begin with, with something that is uh, unique. We have not come across this, this vessel. This, this piece of tabernacle and also temple furniture before. It's known in Hebrew as the kior. Now, a kior, it's commonly used today in, in modern Hebrew for a sink or a, a basin where you wash your, your hands from. But here we're talking about something somewhat larger and something that is sanctified for a purpose for the priests, that they might come and wash their hands, and not just their hands, but we'll see in a moment, also their feet. In preparation to approach, and what we're going to learn is this, that they might approach God and serve Him without dying. Now, this gives us a very different perspective. One that I believe that we should have. And that's this. What if people today would go into a place of worship, a congregational meeting, and if they were not prepared, if they were not there for the right objective, that, that they would be slain by God? Now, I think that would really bring about a change and how people approach worship. And I think it would also impact the number of people who would attend many services. I wonder if we would need these stadiums, that there would be these mega congregations. My thought is probably not. But when we look at the children of Israel, we see a large congregation. We see a faithful priesthood that took seriously that admonition to prepare themselves in order to serve God. Knowing that improper preparation, wrong service, something not according to his word would bring about his judgment, his condemnation that would lead to death. And these are not just thoughts. These are the content of what we're going to be studying today. So again, chapter 30, where we left off last week, book of Exodus, chapter 30, and verse 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, And you shall make kior nechoshet. Nechoshet is, is bronze or copper something along those lines. We've come across that word before. So a bronze, a copper, some will say brass, a brass basin, and also its base. So we have that uh, sink, that, that basin, but also the base which holds it. And it should also, it says here, it should also be this base 
should also be of, of copper. And it should be for washing. That you put it between the tabernacle of meeting and between the altar. Now, some Bibles will, will intercede here the word, the tabernacle of the congregation. But the congregation is not mentioned here. It's the tent of meeting. And it's not referring to the people, but rather the time. It's the Ohel Moed. Moed is the designated place. So it's not speaking about the people when it says the, the tabernacle of the congregation. It doesn't say congregation. It's the tabernacle of the meeting, of the designated place and for a designated purpose. Let's look at this verse once more. Verse eight, bear verse 18. And you shall make the bronze or copper basin. And its base should also be copper for washing. And you shall place it between the tent of meeting and between the altar. And you shall put towards there, meaning in that basin, that, that kior, you should put water. Why? Well, we know it's for washing, but notice what the scripture says. Verse 19. And Aaron and his sons, they will wash from it their hands and their feet. Now, not all the body, we're not talking about here an immersion. Most scholars believe that the immersion took place at a greater distance, not in this location of the tabernacle, but in preparation to enter the tabernacle. And I want to say that again. This immersion, what we call in Hebrew a tevilah. And the place for this tevilah, this immersion, is a mikveh, a ritual bath. These were outside the tabernacle, outside the temple area. And you could go to Jerusalem, and around the temple mount, there are indeed these mikvahot, these ritual baths. But we're talking about something different a final washing a sanctification of a ritualistic washing of the hands and the feet verse 20 when they came into the tent of meeting and they wash with wine literally they wash with water excuse me they wash they will wash with water in order that, notice what it says, velo yamutu, in order that they will not be put to death, or, and this is the second thing, when they come into the tent of meeting, or it says, when they draw near to the altar to serve, and this is for the serving of the burning of the incense, which is a fire offering, unto the Lord. Now, this heightens the importance of what we talked about last week and what we're talking about again this week, and that is the incense offering, which is a fire offering whose smoke goes up unto the Lord. And I mentioned last week, and I'll repeat myself this week, that when the incense offering went up this sweet fragrance this good aroma that was pleasing to God it says that that this accompanied the the prayers of the people going up into the heavens so it's a a good thing look now to verse 21 and they will wash their hands and their feet and this is the second time so that lo yamutu so that they will not die, so they will not be killed. They will not be put to death. So it's not just a, an occurrence. It is a, a willful slaying if they should approach God, having not become properly prepared. And this shall be for them, who's them? The priesthood. 
Aaron and his sons, Chok Olam, which is oftentimes an eternal, but here again, we know it doesn't mean eternal in that sense because in the New Jerusalem, there is no temple. There is no priesthood in the sons of Aaron sense. We'll all be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation unto the Lord in the New Jerusalem. So we're speaking here when it says chok olam. It means a statue for this world, and it foreshadows, it teaches us kingdom principles, kingdom truth. It says here that it's going to be for chok olam, for him, and for his offspring, his seed, throughout their generations. As long as there is a Aaron base house of Aaron priesthood. Well, let's move on to another section, the final section of chapter 30, beginning with verse 22. And here we're talking about the anointing oil. So everything that we've seen, all of this sanctification, this preparation and such, it concludes with what? With their anointing. And it's very interesting what is said here about the importance of this anointing oil. Verse 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall take the spices, besamim rosh. Now, rosh means head or chief. And here it's speaking of probably it's an idiom, besamim rosh, the preferred spices. The ones that God prefers, and not simply prefers, but mandates. These are the primary uh, elements of this incense offering. And the first thing we see is that it is of a, a myrrh, but it's a fine myrrh. And it's 500 measurements. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And it says also fragrant cinnamon. Half of it, it says 250. So of this, this offering that is going to be the, the anointing oil, we find that it has a total weight of 500, but it's going to be divided by two. The first is going to be of this, this sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250, and also a fragrant cane spice that is going to be 250. And then now, verse 24. Now, verse 24 has the word kida. There's going to, and we're going to see this in a moment, there are terms, Hebrew words that are used that we simply cannot be dogmatic about what they mean. And this is one of them. And most of the words, if we see them in the scripture in English, we still don't know what they are exactly. So here, I'm just going to leave it in Hebrew. Kida, 500, and here we have the measurement. 500 measurements of what? The holy shekel. And also olive oil, one hen. So we're being told here, what to use, and how much of it in order to mix. And this word for mixing in a moment is of the utmost significance. Verse 25. And you shall make it, still speaking to Moses, he's officiating and responsible for all. You shall make it, this, this anointing oil, you shall make it, this anointing oil that is holy. Probably better to translate it, you shall make it the holy anointing oil. And then we have this word, the word rokach, sometimes rokach. And this is where we get in modern Hebrew the word for a pharmacy or a pharmacist, the one who makes, mix the, the medicine together using the proper amounts, and we know that if it's not the proper amount, 
it will not have the desired outcome. So this has to do with a skilled individual that is going to be mixing this anointing oil. That it's the work of a mixture. It is the holy anointing oil. It shall be. Verse 26. Now, what do we do with it? Well, notice what's said first. Verse 26. And you shall anoint with it the tent of meeting, O Helmoet, and the ark of the testimony, that is the ark of the covenant, but it's called here our own ha eduk, the ark of the testimony. And the shulchan, this would be the, the table of showbread and its vessels, and also the menorah and its vessels, and the incense altar, and the altar for the burnt offerings, and also its vessels. And finally it says, and the basin, this kior, this type of sink, and its base, its foundation. And you shall sanctify, verse 29, you shall sanctify them. And they shall be, now here's the key. We know that there's a place called Kodesh Kodeshi. And what's unique about this place is this is where the Shkinat Hashem, the glorious dwelling presence of God, is located. Where it was, this presence of God, where it was located in the temple. Now, God, He's everywhere. We speak about God being omnipresent, or in Hebrew, Hamakom. He's located everywhere in every place. As David says, there's no place that I can go that you aren't there. But here's the key, and it's very important that we learn this principle. In a unique way, in a special way, God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. And in that same way, Messiah Yeshua, He is God with us. When He walked in a human body 2,000 years ago, He was God among us. Did that mean that God stopped being omnipresent? It did not. Because it was God the Father who was omnipresent, not God the Son. But Yeshua, He knew all things. He perceived things, saw things, even in locations that He was not physically located in. So we see the divinity in Messiah Yeshua. But what we're speaking about here is this. These other things... Once they are anointed, they also have that same status as the Holy of Holies. And that's why if the priests were not prepared properly, what would happen? They would die. In the same way that the high priest would die if he would enter into the Holy of Holies in an a improper way or if he should do an improper act. So we read here, look at the end of verse 29. You shall sanctify them, these vessels, and they shall be the holy of holies. All the one who touches, everyone who touches it, them shall be holy. And that word means sanctify. They touch these things, and the touching is for a specific purpose. They have a status, a new status, that's related to the work of God. And that's what holiness is. Holiness has to do with something that has a purpose. And when we speak of it holy, in that sense, it's always, always, always related to the purpose of God. And that's why this is so important. Look now to verse 30. And Aaron and his sons... You shall anoint, and you shall sanctify them. For what purpose? What well, says here? Le kahen li, that they serve me. But it's not the word le charet, the normal word for serving. It's word le kahen, where we get the word kohen or priest from, and it's speaking about that they shall serve me as priests. Verse thirty-one. 
Their work impacts the children of Israel. I want to say that again. Their work impacted the children of Israel. And your worship can impact others, their situation. We read in verse 31, And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, now, the children of Israel is hearing this and realizing something, and that is this. There is a separation. The priests, they serve God, but they minister unto the people. They are going to impart a, a outcome, a result from their work upon the people. And if the people do not recognize this work, the significance, the sanctification of their work, notice what's going to happen. They are going to be cut off from the covenant people. Read very carefully, verse 31 again. And to the children of Israel you shall speak, saying, the holy anointing oil. It shall be this unto me throughout your generation. So this is something that he says in this passage, it shall be, this shall be for me, for God. And what does it mean for God? In order to sanctify the priesthood, that the purposes of God can be mediated to the children of Israel. And they have to submit to the work of the priest. That's the implication. Look at verse 32. Upon the flesh of man. This has to do with a typical man. Upon the flesh of man, it shall not be poured out. And it's formula. This is a word for like recipe in modern Hebrew. It's recipe. It shall not be made like it. Don't duplicate it. Nothing should resemble it. It's unique. It's holy. Holy, it shall be, hear the key, for you. Now, he's speaking to who? The children of Israel. This anointing that happened in regard to the work of the priests. This anointing that took place to all these vessels. Go back and read again verse 26. It was putting the temple worship service into force, making it valid in order that this outcome could be mediated to who? As he says here at the end of verse 32, it is holy, it is sanctified for you. Verse 33, a man, no one, should should mix so a certain man should not mix anything like it and whoever shall shall give it it should not be given to it says here al czar what's czar on someone who is not a priest so it is limited to the priesthood and if anyone makes from it or takes from it would probably be a better way to understand it if anyone utilizes it for a typical individual, what's going to happen to him? He says, Ve nikrat me amav. He shall be cut off from his people. He will not any longer have access to the family of God, the covenantal people. If we do not respect the standards of God, the standards of worship, his commands into how worship needs to be done. Failure to do this, you are cut off from the people of God. Verse 34, and the Lord said to Moses, take for yourself, and here we're back to these spices. These spices that are related to the anointing oil. And it says here, you shall take for yourself, meaning in your interest, spices, spices of nataf and also shechelet and chel bena. What are these? These are the words 
that we cannot be dogmatic about. We literally don't know for certainty what it's referring to. There are different types of spices. And we read, look again at verse 34. These are these special spices, these fragrant spices, and also pure frankincense. A measure of measure it shall be. And that means of these four things, this nataf, shachelet, chel beina, and levona, zaka, these four things, each one, according to the commentators, each one should be taken in the same amount. That is the implication of bad beida, bad yihye. It shall all be taken in equal amounts. Verse 35. And you shall make it a, a incense of mixture. And it is the work of one who is skilled in this mixture. And it shall be also salted. It shall be pure and holy. And what do you do with this spice? Well, notice what it says. And you shall... And some Bibles will say pound. It is not the word to pound in a rough way. It's a word to play with it and not in a game or in a careless way. But it's to handle it would probably be a better way of understanding this word here where it says, Vesachakta mimena. Because the end result is hadek. What's that? That, that it should become... Uh, uh, like powder, it should become very thin or tight. And you shall place from it before the, the testimony in the, the temple of meaning. The testimony is the Ark of the Covenant, which I will appear unto you. I'll meet you there. I will be designated in that location there where the Holy of Holies that it shall be unto you. So there in the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant is, that he's going to appear, meaning this is where he's going to dwell. Verse 37. And this, this incense, which you shall do with its, its recipe, with its formula, you shall not make it for yourselves meaning you don't do it for your own purpose for your own pleasure for your own objectives why not because it is holy it should be holy to you of the lord so it's not something that we do for our own personal secular enjoyment or use we utilize it unto the lord but it comes back from him upon us not the anointing oil not this this incense but rather the outcome of our prayers that's what he's talking about last verse verse 40 38 a man says here whomsoever he shall not make like it in order to to smell it now it's something that is only for the Lord. So we don't make it so that we can experience that same fragrance for ourselves. See, worship is unto the Lord, not unto ourselves. We don't go to worship to be blessed. We don't go there to get something from it. We go there to offer to God. And in doing so, it brings His presence into our life. It brings his purposes into our life. And here's what we need to realize. It is only, only when we submit to his purposes, then that presence is going to lead to joy, satisfaction, content. That's why Paul says that he learned the secret of being content in every circumstance because he was experiencing God's presence in his life if someone were to take of it that formula unto himself 
for a, a fragrance for him that he might smell it. Notice once again, this is the second time that this one will be cut off from his people. Now, let me conclude our, our study this evening with, with just one observation. When I look at the first part of what we studied today, we see here that if the priests are not prepared properly, when they go to serve, if they do not wash themselves, sanctify themselves, what happens? They are going to die. We see that in verse 20 and verse 21. Twice it's mentioned that they will be killed. And here we see also two times at the end of verse 33 and at the end of verse 38. Those who misappropriate for their own pleasure this, this type of anointing oil, this fragrance of the incense, if we misappropriate, it is going to lead to being cut off from his people. And that's mentioned twice, like dying is mentioned twice, and it speaks to something. When we are cut off from the people of God, the outcome, the result is not good. It is not a good thing to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. And that's why, and I have prayed significantly over this last statement, and that's why I believe it's so important for people to once again meet for the purpose of corporate worship. Now, when we saw this coronavirus beginning and all the, the, the measures that were taken, I said back in March, we need to give the government the benefit of the doubt. We don't know the implications and such, but more and more, I believe that this is being used, this, this virus, and I don't doubt that there's a virus. I don't doubt that people are dying from it. I don't doubt that this is an important matter. But what I will say to you is this. That, that other things are being done today, yesterday actually, went to the grocery store. It was full of people. People did that. Why? We've got to eat. Here's the thing. We've got to worship as well. If you've been following along the last several weeks, you can see how important worship is for us and to do it unto the Lord. And it can be done safely. If someone's concerned and such, even these large congregations, if you have three services a week, make 12 services a week. Take that mask, wear that mask. You can sing and sing out loud wearing your mask. You can do it. Don't let the authorities tell us how and when to worship. That comes from Scripture. Now, we have to have a good testimony. So 25% of capacity, that's reasonable. So break it into one-fourth. That may mean that the leader may have to go to others to help, to grow other leaders. So they may take one service. If it's a large congregation, three a week, you may have to have 12 a week. If you have two, then you might need eight a week. There's plenty of time. You have Friday night. You have all day Saturday, all day Sunday. You can worship Thursday evening. You can be creative and have a testimony that you can be respectful and recognizing governmental policy, but still it's fine for protests, but if the protests can go on because they are so essential, perhaps they are. Well, then also, also worship can go on. See, I believe that the, the enemy is hijacking this, this pandemic in order to weaken 
the body of believers. In order that, and this may lead, when we look at, and I said this four months ago, that the greatest outcome from this coronavirus may not be the loss of life, and any loss of life is tragic. I'm not trying to minimize that. Be unsympathetic. People are grieving the loss of loved ones. But, but in addition to that, we need to see that perhaps it is this mismanaging of this. I know in the nation that I live in, the leader was speaking about an accordion approach, opening things up and closing them down, like an accordion, opening, closing, depending upon the circumstance. Well, what are they trying to do? Well, they are trying to save life. Now, I don't always want to say that every leader has a, a malicious, an unbiblical, an ungodly agenda. I'm not saying that. I think many do. I think many do. But here's the point. As I was praying, the verse that came into my mind was, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. And we need to realize that holding on to physical life is not the most important thing. The most important thing is worshiping God, having a testimony, sharing that we're committed. And you can be respectful, wear that mask. You can practice some of this social distancing stuff to, as a testimony to the non-believer. But don't allow this to hinder ministry from being done. People need to be praying. Groups need to be coming together, maybe small groups, and praying in people's home. And I believe, I believe that we should not have a spirit of fear, but a spirit of boldness. Not worrying about what might be the earthly implications, but what will be the spiritual implications. So what I'm saying is that we need to wake up. We need to be individuals that demonstrate a confidence in the Lord, not a fear, not a timidness. So we can be respectful. And if it means that we have to have four, five, eight, 10, 12 worship services a week, let's do it. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.